Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Monica, and I'm from the social media team here at the U.S. Embassy. Have you ever dreamed of studying in the United States? Well, this afternoon, um, we're very honored and excited to have a special guest here to talk all about student visas, because a student visa is, very, is a very important part of the process of studying in the United States. And this week, as you probably know, is International Education Week. We got some very exciting news recently, just this week, that actually the number of Pakistani students studying in the United States right now has increased by almost 6% over the past year. Um, so that's great news, and we're um, thrilled about it. Um, so thank you for everyone who submitted questions for our Facebook Live in advance. We'll keep monitoring it and keep answering questions as we have our conversation. Um, so my guest this afternoon is Jim Smithers. He's a consular officer here at the U.S. Embassy. Um, so we're thrilled to have you. Could you introduce yourself, Jim? Thanks, Monica. Um, I'm happy to be here with you today, and I look forward to your questions. I uh, uh, have been here about six months in Pakistan and previously served in Romania and Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm a consular officer here, so every day I interview uh, potential students seeking to study in the United States. Um, and uh, I'm, hope I'm happy to... Uh, sort of uh, peel back the onion a little bit uh, on that process for you today and, and help explain uh, the, uh, the process and the interview and some of the rules you need to know going forward. Uh, before I joined the State Department, I worked uh, in the United States Senate uh, as a staffer for about five years, and then before that I served as an Army officer. Uh, I'm originally from Virginia. I went to the Virginia Military Institute for my bachelor's degree and to Georgetown University for my MBA. Great. Thanks. Okay, um, so we'll get started, but just before we get started, just to mention, we can't, un unfortunately, we can't answer specific questions about specific cases in our discussion today. We're just going to talk in general about student visas and the visa process. Um, we also can't talk about immigrant visas. That's a whole separate process. This is just non-immigrant visas for, for studying in the United States. Okay, so let's get started. So let's talk first about just the general process. Um, I know sometimes students are confused whether they need to apply first to a university or first for the visa. So could you walk us through the different steps for applying? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good question. It is very important to apply to a university first in the U.S. and get accepted. That begins the process for you, for your potential studying in the United States. Once the institution has accepted you, then they will issue you an I-20 or a DS-2019 form that outlines the financial requirements for the degree, and shows what you plan to major in and some of these other details, you'll need to show that form at the embassy when you come for your interview. Um, it's also important that you, uh, once you've got those forms, that you pay what's called a SEVIS fee. It's a student or an exchange visitor fee that you have to pay before you come into the embassy. Um, but once you have those forms, then you can come to the embassy website and schedule your interview. Uh, it's, you can usually do that about four months out from your uh, potential start date for school. Okay, perfect. So that's really helpful, I think, for people to, to understand that first you really need to apply for the university. Yeah. Only after you get accepted do you apply for the visa. That's right. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so we have a question from Asma Yukub, um, who asks, kindly guide us um, about master's study scholarships and visa policies and procedures. So just to be clear, we're not talking today about scholarships. Um, because that's a whole separate conversation, which we'd love to have at another point. But the best resource for scholarship information we recommend is the United States Ed Educational Foundation in Pakistan, USEFP. There are partners here, um, as well as Education USA. They have lots of resources about scholarships, so I encourage everyone to, to check them out on Facebook or on their website. And we'll give you those links in a little bit. Okay, so... Um, Let's talk now a little bit um, about the different types of visas. I know there are a few different types of student visas, so could you tell us about the types? Right, there's three different types uh, of visa categories. There's the F, the J, and the M. The F tends to be the most common for folks going to study for a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in the U.S. The J is typically for an exchange program. Uh, those are many times paid for by some sort of grant by the university. Uh, by the Pakistani government or the U.S. government. And the important thing about it, the difference between a J and an F is that the J tends to be more closed-ended on, on the expiration date. That's an important point to, to point out. Um, the M visa is much less common. That's for vocational training like cooking school 
or flight training for students that want to become pilots. Uh, but for most of the folks watching today, the F would be the category they would apply mm -hmm. to for undergraduate or master's level education mm -hmm. in the U.S. Okay, perfect. Um, so if you are just joining us now, my guest is Jim. He's a consular officer here at the U.S. Embassy, and we are talking about student visas because this week is International Education Week. Okay, so um, Jim, let's talk now about you've gotten accepted by American University, you've applied for the visa, and now it's time for the interview. Ah, a lot of people are very scared of the interview, but right. maybe... Maybe it shouldn't be so scary, so tell us about well, that. Well, first, interview. congratulations on being accepted to the university. That's, uh, that's great news. Um, and the interview, uh, people, people will be scared about the process, uh, but it'll be over before you know it. The interview is, is uh, usually, they're pretty brief interviews. Um, and we also are human. Uh, we understand what it's like to interview with someone and that you'll be nervous. That's very normal. Um, so it's okay to be nervous. I want to say that up front. We understand uh, the situation, and that's, uh, this is important to your life plan to, uh, and to your career, uh, your choice to study in the U.S. Uh, the most important thing that we're looking for is whether you overcome immigrant intent. By law, the U.S. immigration law, um, we have to, as a consular officer, I have, to, uh, I have to think that you are going to the U.S. for the purpose that you stated and that you not, do not plan to misuse that visa or plan to overstay or try to live or work in the U.S. when you're not authorized to do so. So that's very important. So the, and the most, common, uh, the most common rejection, if you will, is under that category, which is 214B. Um, the other part of the interview it's, that it's incumbent upon you to share with the officer is how this, how this education, this degree that you're seeking and that you're going to pay a lot of money for, usually, they're very expensive, um, the story has to make sense. Why do you plan to spend all this money to study in the U.S.? Granted, the U.S. has a great education system, um, but does it make sense for you and your career plan? We want to hear that from you. What, what's the plan after you get this bachelor's or master's or Ph.D. degree? And then also, very important, the hard part sometimes, how will you pay for it? Um, as I said, some of the schools in the U.S. can be expensive, and it is by law, by our regulation, something that you as the applicant have to prove to us that you have the funds or the scholarship or financial aid to pay for the degree that you've applied and been accepted to. And then finally, what do you plan to do when you finish the degree? Um, you know, lay, sort of lay out for the officer briefly. Uh, once you get that degree, then what do, what do you plan to do next? And just be open and honest about that, uh, and things will go well. Great. Thanks. I understand that the majority of student visas are approved. Are. Um, occasionally, there's the need for rejection. Some people were asking on our Facebook page, um, what should people kind of understand about a rejection, or what should they do next? Right. right. If you are if you are rejected under 214B, that section of the law, that that decision is a, is final, but it doesn't mean you can't apply again. So I will mention that. Um, we generally don't encourage applicants to apply repeatedly unless their situation has changed significantly, whether financial, you have a new scholarship or financial situation has changed. Um, but it's not, it's not the end of the world. We always will tell you both verbally and we'll hand you a written piece of paper explaining why you've been um, rejected. So as I said, many times it's 214B that you didn't show that you qualified for the visa for some reason, some aspect of the qualification or that you don't overcome that intent to immigrate, that um, you, you must prove as an applicant, the burden of proof is on you to show that you do plan to come back to Pakistan. Right. Okay. Um, if you're just joining me now, my guest is Jim. He's a consular officer here at the U.S. Embassy, and we're talking about student visas. Um, I see we're starting to get a lot of questions, so thank you very much for all your questions. Um, I did want to mention one question um, that uh, Hashir Afak had, who says, does the university ranking affect the possibility of getting a visa? So um, does the university ranking, I guess, in the United States affect um, the chance of getting a visa? No, it's a, that is a great question, because and we hear this a lot. We hear this question a lot, both from the universities in the U.S. They're wondering why their students aren't getting accepted, if somehow their ranking is affecting that. Um, we hear that from the applicants as well. And the answer is really no, because we hear, I see many good applicants that are going to schools that perhaps don't rank that high or have a, a different focus than maybe an Ivy League school or, or another high-level institution in the U.S. But as long as the story makes sense for that applicant, mm -hmm. their career plan, 
their family plan, if you will, what they want to do in their life and what they've done in the past, then there's no problem. All, all applicants are kind of seen equal and universities are seen as being equal. And we really, by law, that's how we have to view them. And there are so many different types of uh, universities in the right. United States. I think people sometimes don't realize how many universities we have, right. but we have um, just many different universities and types of universities as right. well. Okay, so let's talk a little about um, the required documents that people need to bring during an interview. Um, sometimes people might be concerned that they don't have all the documents, so what are the kind of the basic documents that people need to bring? Right. Well, first and foremost, you need to bring your passport with you, uh -huh. um, and uh, make sure you have an appointment. Uh, you've confirmed your appointment, you've paid your SEVIS fee, I mentioned that earlier, that's your student or exchange visitor fee, and you can pay that online. Make sure you've done that well in advance of the interview because we need to we need to be able to see it in the system and sometimes it takes a little while for it to show up that you've paid. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, you may need to bring a an extra photo if you don't have a if you don't have uh, current photos. Um, it's always a good idea to bring photos for the visa so that we can scan those in. And then your I twenty form for your F and M student visas. That's the form that you'll get from the school right. that shows you've been accepted and what the financial requirements are. Mm -hmm. Or the DS twenty nineteen for those J visas, those exchange mm -hmm. visitors. Mm -hmm. You need to have that as well. Um, the other documentation, I would refer you to our website because we do give, some, and we'll show you that at the end of today's session. Um, a link to the to our websites that provide some more detailed information, but. Generally, remember, one of the requirements is you have to be able to show that you can afford to pay for school. So bring whatever documents you might have for that, whether it's a bank statement or something like along those lines that shows that you have the financial means to pay for school. Mm -hmm. Speaking of our website, um, I'm excited that we will very soon have Urdu information about visas for the first time on our website, so please check that out soon. Okay, um, so let's now go to a few more questions from our um, Facebook um, users and social media fans. Um, so I want to ask a question from Husnain Rai, who said, I want to apply without any consultant or I guess um, organization that's or business that's helping. Um, can you please brief me on the process for student visas and applying without the help of a consultancy? Right. Everyone should know, and that's a great question because I want to share with you that it's not a requirement that you use a visa consultant um, or a firm that sort of acts as a go-between or courier um, for the visa process. Um, and in fact, many times those services, those consultant firms, don't provide good advice. Um, and there's a lot of bad information out there on the internet about how to, um, you know, practice or train or game the system for uh, for your interview. Generally speaking, um, I'm. Speaking for myself and some of my colleagues here, we see a lot of applicants every day. And so we can usually pretty quickly tell those students who have a legitimate reason to study in the U.S., have a good story, the story makes sense, and those applicants that have been coached somehow or they're, they're speaking from a memorized script, um, the interviews usually, usually don't go as well for them. So I, to answer whose name's question, I would just say I, you know, I would avoid most consultants that are out there um, because you really don't need to use one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that's great advice. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Fatima Said, um, who would like to go to the U.S. Um, for graduate studies, um, and she would like to apply for um, her husband and her daughter. So can you bring dependents with you on a student visa? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. So, yes, for, uh, for student visas and the exchange visitors, you can bring dependents with you. Um, it is important that you are able to prove that relationship during the interview. So if you want to bring your spouse with you or your children, make sure you have a valid marriage certificate. Make sure it's in, uh, in English. And uh, also you need to have birth certificates for any children you have. And here in Pakistan, um, some applicants will bring the family registration certificate, and that's a helpful document for officers like me to be able to quickly see that in tandem with the marriage certificate and birth certificate, that indeed these are... Um, your family members and that they qualify. Mm -hmm. They'll also need to have their own um, I-20 or uh, DS 2019. They'll need to be shown on those forms um, that it is valid, uh, that the, their connection to you is valid and mm -hmm. that the institution knows that they're coming. Right. Yeah. It's good to know that you can bring your family yes, members. absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, we're getting a few questions about work visas. As a reminder, we're talking mainly about student visas. Um, although sometimes you can work 
a little bit right. on a student visa, but it's not a primarily a work visa. That's correct. Yeah, and, then, and if you wanted to get into the details of whether you can and cannot work in certain categories, then I would recommend you go to the websites that we'll mm -hmm. show you at the end of this session. Okay, great. Um, some people were also asking about they don't know why they were refused. We talked earlier about the, the sheet. Right. Do you want to say anything else right. about the, the, the sheet? The consular officer will, will give you, will explain. I, I can understand that uh, I can understand that it, that process could be frustrating when you put a lot of effort into applying for school, you get accepted, you get your funds together, and then you go for your interview and you and you don't get the visa or, or somehow get refused. Um, so I do sympathize with, um, with applicants in that respect, and we all do because we're human as well. But just know that there's, it's usually not just one particular thing. I've had applicants at the window, I've, I've said, you know, you don't qualify for this visa and here's why, and, and you ha I hand them the section of the law that explains why they've been refused. And they want to know, you know, what's the specific reason, what can I do better next time? 90%, I would just say 90, roughly 90% of the time, it's usually not one specific thing or reason why an applicant gets refused. Um, it's usually the totality of the circumstances. It's usually that uh, just in overall terms, the, either the financial uh, situation isn't clear to the officer that's doing the interview, um, or the story doesn't quite make sense. Why did you pick this particular school? Um, but again, as I always say, you can, you can apply again um, if you've been rejected. Mm -hmm. um, but we do recommend that you do so only if your situation has somehow improved mm -hmm. since your last interview. Okay. If you're just joining us now, I'm talking to Jim. He's the consular officer here at the U.S. Embassy. Um, and we're talking about student visas because it's International Education Week. Um, so thank you all for your questions. I'm looking at a question from Mohammed um, Shahin Abid, who says, how many legal hours can I work during my studies if I get a student visa? And so um, we were referring him, I think, right. to, the, to the website. It is There is a cap, yeah. yeah. There, is, there are some specific yeah. details, and I don't want to give you the, the wrong information and quote that sort of level of detail, but please go to the website and it'll give you that information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Muhammad Sheikh is asking if there's a list of highly acceptable universities on the embassy website or any universities that we're not recommending. I don't believe no, we, we, we have that. No, we, general, we generally don't. Um, and it goes back to the earlier question about the quality of the university and whether there's a difference for visa approval rates, and there really isn't. Um, but uh, make sure that the school you apply to is, is accredited uh, in some way uh, by... Uh, and you can usually check this out online. And you might want to go to some of the com more common uh, university rankings. You can kind of get a sense of the schools that are that are in the you know in the upper tier, or at least somehow are on the radar of some of the publications that rank universities. Because then at least you know they're accredited. Certainly, <clears throat> a school doesn't need to be in the top twenty or even the top one hundred. Uh, uh, we see, I see schools every day that I've never heard of, and mm -hmm. I approve those visas because they they come with valid. I-20 mm -hmm. or DS-2019, the student's story makes sense, what they plan to do and study mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the good news is to this question is that there isn't uh, a list. Uh, as long as you apply to a good school that's, uh, that is accredited, mm -hmm. no problem. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from Mohammed Sheikh who says, um, do your children get free education in the United States if they accompany you? So I believe you can enroll them in public that's school right. um, <clears throat> you because can. you're living there that's in the right. United States. That's right. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can. Not private school. I imagine that's a different situation. Right. And, but, and, and um, you, yeah, that's right. Right. That's, right. that's right. We also have gotten some questions about um, uh, administrative processing okay. and what that means or what you can tell us about sure. how long people might have to wait. Sure. It's not uncommon to be told that your application has been refused under what's called 221G which means we need more information to make the decision to approve your visa. Sometimes it, it means we need to see more financial documents from you, we want to see one of your old passports, or we, want to, or we need to check something uh, to make sure that there's no security-related issues, criminal-related issues, it could be, it runs the gamut uh, of, of things. And, and many times the officer that's doing the interview, we don't, we don't know what the issue might be, we just know that there's more um, there's more details that need to be looked at, and usually this takes place back in Washington. Um, and so we submit your application. Usually you'll be asked to provide 
uh, additional information like your resume or CV, uh, your travel history, and you can do all those things after the interview and submit them online over email. Um, if we do, we do reject you under 221G and administrative processing, we'll send you an email and ask you to provide that information over email. So the good news is you don't have to come back into the embassy. We know that many applicants travel from far, um, from far away places and uh, the drive can be long to get to Islamabad uh, or Karachi if you're interviewing there. Um, so the good news is you don't have to come back in. The process can be done over email and then if we get that information from you, then we can uh, move your case to a final decision. Mm -hmm. But it is incumbent upon the applicant, I will mention, that if you're told you've been refused under 221G and it's administrative processing, please check your email, check your spam folder, make sure you find that email from us so that you respond to it in a timely fashion because we're really waiting on you at that point to provide that information right. to us so that we can right. proceed with processing. Okay, good to know. Mm -hmm. um, some people are asking about immigration issues. Again, we're talking about student visas. So with student visas, you're not immigrating to the United States permanently. You're only temporarily going to the United States right. and returning to Pakistan after your studies are complete. So it's not an immigrant visa. Um, an immigrant visa is a completely separate type of visa. Um, okay, some people are asking about English tests, about TOEFL and IELTS. Um, I'd recommend you reach out to Education USA on that question because that's really an admissions question to universities and Today we're talking about the student visa process, which again is after you've already been admitted into an American university. Right. Okay. And I'll, I'll just, mm -hmm. uh, while you're looking at other mm -hmm. questions, I'll mention that uh, the, one of the common applications we see is for pathways programs, so folks that are going for English as a second language, then that, that's connected to maybe a bachelor's degree or a master's degree once mm -hmm. they've improved their English uh, level. Uh, and that's a very acceptable application and a very acceptable path uh, for studying in the United States. So I don't know if this, this particular questioner had this in mind, but don't, uh, don't let that hold you back from wanting to study in the U.S. if your English isn't great. Um, if you get accepted to the school and they have a, a, what's called a pathway program or an ESL, English as a Second Language program, many times they'll give you that time in the United States to improve your English and then you can start your degree. Mm -hmm. And that won't hold you back or change your chances of getting approved for the visa. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Kashif would like to know, can we send my brother for free studies? Um, so I think what's important to know with the student visas is you need to apply yourself, right? There's right. no petitioner like with immigrant visas. That's right. That's the correct. student is applying directly. That's correct. Yeah, you only need to have that relationship with the institution that you've been accepted to. Um, but they're not really petitioning per se on your behalf. It's up to you to come for your own interview and to qualify for the visa. Right. Okay. Anything different about like applying for a student visa for a PhD? Soha Ali says um, she would like to. Uh, Soha would like to apply for a student visa for a PhD. Okay. We see a lot of PhD uh, candidates going to the United States to study, uh, and again, it goes back to. Does that, does that plan, that course of study make sense? Are you going to study your PhD in an area that you've already been working in that isn't a complete 180 from where you are now? Um, but you know, most, just like you would expect, most candidates that are going for a PhD are well-educated. Um, they have a master's degree um, uh, and they have a plan. They know why, because it's usually, there's money involved with studying and getting a PhD and there's a time commitment. If, if nothing else, there is a time commitment to, um, the opportunity cost of not working and going for a PhD can be big. So to make that decision that you're going to give up, let's say, three to five years of your life to go for that PhD, I really want to hear, why are you making that decision? It, you know, it needs to make sense that you're going to go do that. Mm -hmm. um, and the good news is most of the PhD candidates we see here in Pakistan are eminently qualified um, and we welcome them to the U.S. because they bring a lot of intellectual firepower to our university and mm -hmm. expand the diversity there. So really do encourage them to apply. Great. Um, so Mirza is asking, is it necessary that the person paying my tuition fee is a blood relative? Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm sorry, the, the, in terms of who's um, sponsoring the, and paying yes. for the tuition? Is, do they have to be related to oh. me by blood? No, no, they don't actually. Um, it really, again, and I, I 
probably repeated this too many times, but if, if it makes sense um, how you're being funded, then then uh, then okay. Many times we do see family members. We understand the culture, the family culture here in Pakistan, or we try at least we try to understand it. And uh, so it's not uncommon for us to approve visa applicants uh, where their uncle is paying for their program or some other member of their family. Probably the most common is that your parents are going to pay for the program, but that's that's not necessarily a requirement. Okay, great. Um... Wajula Zahidi is asking about B1, B2 visas. Again, that's a different type of visa. That's a tourist visa. Um, so I'd recommend you check out our website where we have all, all the information about all the different types of visas. Um, so today we were just talking about student visas. Um, I think we are actually about out of time. Um, so I do want to, to make sure everyone realizes all the different fantastic resources that we have out there and that are available to you. Um, so we're going to show you some websites um, for Education USA, which is an amazing resource where you can get free advising services um, to, to help you apply to an American university. Um, you should check out USEFP, uh, United States Educational Foundation in Pakistan. They implement many of our exchange programs here in Pakistan if you're interested in just studying for a short amount of time in the United States. Um, so we're going to show you all the different websites that are available to you um, to, to refer to for further information. Yeah, absolutely. I encourage you to check out these sites uh, because, as I mentioned before, there is a lot of misinformation on the Internet. So. If you're going to one of these sites, you know you're getting good information. So mm -hmm. um, check those early and often as you start down this path to studying in the U.S. Perfect. Well, I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to answer all of your questions, but thank you all for submitting such great questions. I hope this has helped you understand a bit more about the student visa process and um, demystified the process for you as Hopefully well. A little. <laughs> yes. um, so keep checking us out. Also on Facebook, we always post new information about exchange programs or study in the United States opportunities, as well as information about our alumni who've returned here to Pakistan and are doing some pretty amazing work. So thank you all. Thank Thanks you very too. much. Thanks, Monica. It's good to be here. Thanks.